Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Bhutang Dhammang Sankang Namasami Nice to have the opportunity to um, offer some reflections to community and guests at Amrawati. Sometimes um, when it's time to give a reflection, the mind uh, doesn't become so clear about what, <laughs> what one would like to talk about, one particular theme. So something I like to do whenever that happens is open up um, the field a little and uh, try to see what people are interested to know about. Because actually I've been here four months now, spent most of my time training in Thailand, but actually don't know most of the people who come here. So I'm not actually that sure what would be most relevant to you or what would be interesting to you. So I thought I'd open things up for questions and answers. But um, I also don't think it's so healthy for the monks and nuns to have to be so passive and be um, vulnerable to the questions of the lay people. So I'm going to ask you some questions. (laughs) For a start, that can be a start. My first question, in terms of mental qualities in Buddhist practice, what do you think is the most important mental quality? Anyone have any ideas? Look, I'll give you a hint. Arjun Samedo talks about it all the time. You have to answer. (laughs) Mindfulness, that's right. Okay, next question. Why? Why is mindfulness important? What is mindfulness? That's the first question. What is mindfulness? You all know, if you think about it, What is mindfulness? If I was Ajahn Sumedho now, I'd be very depressed. (laughs) Awareness, that's right. Clear awareness, awakened awareness, truth discerning awareness which is different to awareness which is affected by negative qualities. What kind of negative qualities, what are the three root chilesas, three root defilements that affect unenlightened beings' minds? Any ideas? That's right, greed, hatred and delusion. So you could say that a mind which is uh, deeply affected by greed or hatred or a form of delusion, has a very weak sati at that time, weak mindfulness. Whereas when one cultivates mindfulness, mindfulness becomes clearer and sharper and the defilement becomes weaker. So this is why mindfulness is very important. Because uh, what happens, we're all stuck with this experience of um, perceiving things in terms of self and other. And this is a very, very deep habit. And when we think that we're a self, mindfulness is already a little bit weak. And when we feed that delusion by believing it and uh, conceiving of others as selves as well, uh, a lot of kilesa tends to be present in the mind. Because the self 
is established on kilesa and feeds on kilesa. So mindfulness is very important. When mindfulness is weak, the self will be there. That's just what happens. That's the predicament we're in. Self-view is a, a very, very deep habit. If mindfulness is weak, you'll be thinking that you're a self. And you'll be thinking that others are solid beings as well. When mindfulness gets clear and sharp, it's not so solid. Because mindfulness can see the truth. So if mindfulness is nice and clear, you'll be aware of a feeling. Or you'll be aware of a thought. Instead of, he said that and he shouldn't have. She didn't do that and she should have which is a, a few steps down the, the trail. So mindfulness is very important. Maintaining some clarity in the mind so that we can know when the mind is affected by wholesome and unwholesome qualities. So there is, there is wholesome and there is unwholesome, fortunately for us because we can encourage the mind to pick up wholesome mind states, cultivate wholesome mind states, and we can train the mind to abandon negative mind states. So now I have another question. What things support the development of mindfulness? What activities support mindfulness? Meditation, okay. Anything else? Maintaining virtue, very good. Meditation, maintaining virtue, anything else? I'll give you a hint. The Buddha taught a threefold training. We have sila and bhavana. What's the other one? Dana. Dana, that's right. So things which support the growth or the maintenance, the cultivation of mindfulness, generosity, virtue and meditation. How many people really believe that generosity is necessary? Raise your hands. <laughs> what do you do? What is the effect when you're generous? What is the effect upon other beings when you're generous? That's the effect on, on you. Very good. Effect. The effect of being generous towards others, what's the effect on them? Yeah. They receive something that they need. Okay, so Something which is, uh, I think, really good to understand is not just that doing dana and giving gifts is uh, something that can feel nice. Sometimes it doesn't feel nice. Sometimes you don't want to give something away. But it's still good if you do. The effect of generosity is that it makes other people's lives easier. It reduces their suffering and it enables them to do the things that they need to do. That's enormously important in terms of karma in as much as when you come up to an obstruction, as we all do, inner and external obstructions, if you've been generous, supports will be there to help you in most cases. So this is actually very important. I just thought I'd mention that because one of the things we don't realize about dana, we, or one of the things that might obstruct us from embracing it truly wholeheartedly is not understanding the implications of it. In terms of our meditation, being generous does weaken grasping at the self. Because it's going against selfishness. We have to give away things that we might want to use ourselves. So it kind of goes against that grasping, that contraction, and it trains us and this is also very important, it trains us in letting go. So one monk friend of mine in, in Thailand uh, 
once mentioned to me that he felt that um, this whole function, Ajahn Chah talks about, of letting go of unskillful mind states, and this whole function of being able to do that so that mindfulness and well-being are in the mind. He felt that generosity played an enormous uh, role in establishing that function, that mental function, it actually being able to give away physical things, is uh, establishing this capacity to relinquish a painful mind state. And I think that he was onto something. So in that respect, I do believe that dana generosity supports uh, a weakening of the uh, self-view and supports that function of mindfulness not just being aware of unskillful but also having the capacity to let go of it to relinquish it because that's another important thing that mindfulness with clear comprehension does we recognize skillful we can embrace that and cultivate that we recognize unskillful and then we have to try to abandon that, relinquish that, let go, as Ajahn Chah talks about. So I think generosity plays a very important role there. Sila, maintaining ethical precepts, supporting mindfulness. If you think about it, if ever you're going to break a precept or whenever you do break a precept, what's going on in the mind at that moment is that a, a unskillful quality is in the mind and you've decided to act upon it. So what happens there, acting upon that, acting upon an unskillful mind state in your mind, darkens the mind makes karma with unskillful mind states, makes karma with kilesa, makes bad karma. What happens then is that the mind becomes darker, mindfulness gets weaker. So it is good to know, my teacher in Thailand, Ajahn Anand, talks about this, uh, kind of in a present moment, pachupana dhamma, kind of in that kind of manner, that when you break the precept, you damage your sati. So it's not, it's not like a, it's not a moralistic teaching. If you do this, if you keep these rules, it's nice and uh, people suffer less. It's actually directly related to your mind in the present moment, whether it's wholesome, whether it's unwholesome, whether it will become bright or whether it will darken, whether mindfulness will be sharp and clear and strong or whether it will be weak. So the five precepts is this... Uh, beginning to protect the mind. Ajahn Anand talks about it as being like these little amulets you get in Thailand with Buddha images. You can get nice boxes for them. And he says, when you decide to keep the five precepts, it's like keeping your Buddha in a nice box so that it won't break. And he says, if you uh, don't keep the five precepts, you do break the Buddha. So it's like breaking the precepts embraces unskillful mental qualities and damages sati. Whereas maintaining them increases sati. Gives sati a, a chance to grow. Another thread I wanted to try to tie into tonight's reflection was this, uh, actually, the, f the uh, factors of jhana. And it's, uh, it's a little bit bold of me to want to talk about this particular list because actually I don't have jhana. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, anyway, these things, these lists are reflective tools and we can... Uh, we can use them in practical ways and contemplate them. So the five factors of jhana, vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata. 
So vitaka is uh, placing the mind on an object. Vichara is sustaining the mind on that object. Now, just talking about those two, it is the reason I want to talk about. I think it's very relevant uh, because we have to work with these qualities. This list that the Buddha gave us is pointing to how the mind works. So vitaka and vichara is actually always working in the mind. The mind needs objects. And the mind will have a wholesome, a neutral, or an unwholesome object. Because the mind needs nourishment. So vichara is keeping the mind with that object. Not letting it stray. Piti, rapture. Sukha, bliss. Ekagata, one-pointedness. So that's a talk. That's referring to a very collected, very lofty, radiant, uh, still one-pointed mind state. But all of us as meditators, even if we have not established Ekagata, one-pointedness, all of us will have had experience of rapture and some bliss. And the sukha, my teacher in Thailand, translated as sumop yen, which is more like tranquility, actually, than bliss. So what I wanted to mention this for is just using this as a reflective tool. Whenever people were suffering, Arjun Chah would say, you suffer because of wrong thinking. So there's a very important uh, hint there, or clue, about how we go about being happy and peaceful people. And it's pointing to the value and the, the importance of right view as well, having skillful view, the clear comprehension. But what happens is if we, if we place the mind on a wholesome object, a skillful object, rapture, bliss and tranquility is the result. So we can see that, even without jhana, we can see that if we really open the heart to loving kindness for a period of time, and you genuinely feel some loving kindness either towards yourself or other beings, there's feelings of well-being. There's some feeling of rapture, some feeling of contentment. Very good, correct practice. Similarly, breath meditation, the mind really stays with the breath for a period of time. Other things drop away. Deep, so maybe some rapture, deepening feeling of tranquility. Very good. Vitaka and Vichara, what happens when someone says something that hurt our feelings? We go back to our room and we think about it. He said, D -d 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 -d. she said, B -b 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 -b. <laughs> that monk looked at me like that again. <laughs> what happens? What happens to the mind when we allow it to do that? Because this is Vitaka and Vichara. And then what happens two days later when you're still thinking, I can't believe he did it again. <laughs> and uh, I'm just pointing to this because we can make ourselves miserable and then maintain our misery by holding on to painful perceptions. And our only chance of being genuinely happy is learning not to do this. So this is a, a wonderful thing about the Buddha's teaching is that it tells us that we can take responsibility and it tells us that we have to take responsibility and that of course is much easier to say than to do but at the very least whenever we find ourselves experiencing suffering we can hold a mirror to that and ask ourselves what mind state what am I placing my mind on or what has my mind absorbed into? Because sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we've gone too far down the track to actually, when mindfulness is good, we can stop ourselves taking a wrong turn. But when we've already gone there, we have to look, where am I? Where am I and how did I get here? So whenever there's some misery or some dukkha, just heaviness, lack of joy, we have to ask ourselves, well, what nourishment am I giving the mind? What am I feeding the mind? What perceptions am I 
allowing my mind to dwell upon. As Westerners, we have a real challenge here because we're very clever and there are faults everywhere. There are real problems and real flaws, very real. And so <laughs> the thing is, we're always forgetting that that's normal. We have this sense that it shouldn't be like that. We're often saying like this, it shouldn't be like that. He shouldn't be like, she shouldn't be like that, and I shouldn't be like this. And, um, but this is the samsaric predicament is, there's problems everywhere. That's uh, <laughs> the noble, the first noble truth. Real problems, faults. You'll never find a perfect monastery. You'll never find a perfect teacher. You'll never have a perfect mind. In terms of, uh, Adam Sumedha also talked about in terms of personalities. So what I think is very, very important for all of us to learn how to do is seeing a fault, seeing a flaw, recognizing a problem and not dwelling on it. So, and this is tricky because we've all made a lot of karma here. And we're all very good at it. That feeling of rightness that we get. I think there's a kind of an addictive quality about that. As painful as self-view is, it's addictive. We're attached to it, I'll put it that way. So when we have that nice, strong feeling of, I know how things should be and I know how they shouldn't be. And they definitely shouldn't be like this. We all do this in one way or another. Recognize the feeling of self train in recognizing, okay, this is, Ajahn Sumedha also talks, Sakaya Ditti. And then, truthfully, humbly, ask yourself, are you happy now? Uh, is, this a, is this experience an experience of well-being? And if it's not, then we have to take responsibility and we can ask ourselves, what wholesome object could I pick up now? Or how could I see this challenge or this difficulty or this problem in a more wholesome context. And we can always do that. So when, when the mind focuses on a problem, it might be the government, it might be the recession, it might be ecological disaster, it might be injustice, all of these very valid things which, if we focus upon, can make us miserable. How do you see those kind of problems, or it could be politics in the monastery, how do you see that in a wholesome context? So this is, this is our challenge. This realm of yoni so mani sakara, skillful reflection, wise reflection, as opposed to a yoni so mani sakara, unskillful reflection. We have to remind ourselves of the basics, aspects of skillful view. Recognizing that we're fortunate. Among human beings, we're fortunate. So we're always forgetting this. When our mind becomes negative and dark, we forget that we're fortunate. So this is a matter of re-establishing the context, seeing things more correctly in terms of the situation that we're in, the broader situation. So that compared to the 300 million beggars in India, that's, that's real, that's a real statistic. My situation is pretty good. If you really believe in Buddhist cosmology, I do. The Buddha says that most beings are in hell. So compared to those billions of beings in hell, my situation suddenly not looking so bad. If you understand that uh, eons go for extremely long times and that most of the time in an eon, Buddha's teachings aren't around, these are aspects of right view or cosmology. These kind of reflections, they work, they, can, they sober the mind up. It's like, oh, as real as my suffering or my problem seems, I am among those few beings 
who have met the Buddha's teaching. Not only have I met the Buddha's teaching, I have an opportunity to practice those teachings. Even without the context of beginning earth time and samsara going forever, you just think in terms of how many beings there are on the planet now, six billion, how many of those beings have met the Buddha's teaching? Of the beings who recognize the Buddha's teaching, how many of those beings uh, understood them? Conceptually, how many beings actually had the reflective faculty or the education to actually get it? There is a noble truth of suffering, there is a cause. Uh, understanding the causes, weakening the causes, relinquishing the causes, there is an opportunity for liberation. How many people meet that teaching? If you work it out as a percent, it's very small. So this is when we take, suppose we've found ourselves somewhere miserable, we use skillful reflection to cheer ourselves up, brighten the mind, essentially. When the mind is brightened, you'll probably find that you can meditate. You can stay with your meditation object, you'll stop obsessing about whatever it is that throws the mind down. So I have, I have to practice like this a lot in my own practice, because we all have a particular gift here. We get hurt feelings, uh, and then we can dwell on that. I don't want to sound too immodest, but I'm generally a fairly nice human being. <laughs> and one of my particular challenges is one walks around wondering, kind of, well, I don't speak to people like that. Why do people speak to me like that? Or, well, I don't do that. Well, why? <laughs> why does it? Why does such and such do that to me? And that can, you know, that can be a depressing experience and a very real reality. Of <laughs> and then, uh, but if ever I find the mind contracts into that, it's like, well, hang on. You have an opportunity here to brighten the mind. Uh, if you can keep the mind on a wholesome object, you might experience some bliss and some rapture today. If you want to hang on to this hurt feeling and develop a grudge, you'll be miserable. So I have to challenge myself in that way frequently. And um, I suppose we all do. And, uh, so vitaka and vichara. The mind is being placed on objects. The mind is being absorbed in objects. When mindfulness is weak, it will tend to get absorbed into unskillful objects. So we have to take responsibility to try to keep our mindfulness clear. That's daily meditation practice. And then practicing throughout the day, knowing what you're doing with your body, knowing what you're thinking, knowing what you're feeling, knowing what you're about to say, knowing what you're saying. So that, uh, as they say in Thai, root dua, you know yourself. Keeping, keeping some consistent, broad awareness and then recharging that. Ajahn uh, Anand, my teacher in Thailand says, meditate morning, afternoon and evening every day. So rather than setting the uh, post so high that you're going to meditate at least 10 hours a day or 8 hours a day, he would say make it more that you keep a minimum, that you won't go below a certain amount of practice. And then when you have time, you can do more. You can do more practice than your minimum. But he would say the minimum is 3 hours, for monastics anyway. If you can meditate every morning, every afternoon and every evening, Recognizing, he would say, notice what is affecting the mind, wholesome or unwholesome dhammas, key lasers, hindrances, or wholesome mind states. If it's unwholesome, bring it into balance using skillful reflection or meditation objects. Doing this three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening, he said over a period of time you can be fairly sure that key laser will be weakening, delusion will be weakening, mindfulness will be getting better. But it does need that kind of consistent... Uh, feeding of the wholesome, nurturing of the wholesome. The more we train ourselves in placing the mind on wholesome objects and then staying with that wholesome object and then experiencing the rapture and the tranquility and the well-being that comes from meditating correctly, thinking skillfully, uh, the more we can maintain those disciplines, we see the value of it. And we become more sensitive to the suffering when, uh, when we don't maintain them. So having experienced the genuine well-being, having, ex having experienced spaciousness, perhaps not 
complete freedom from the self-view, but at least a sense of a wholesome, very spacious, non-reactive, benevolent self, that is already a lot less suffering. And then when we lose that, when we become a miserable self, a hungry ghost self, or an animal self, or a hell self, it's, a, it's, it's dukkha. So we want to get back to re-establishing the wholesome, making the mind bright again. And uh, Ajahn Anand uses other metaphors. He's quite cosmological in his teaching, more so than others. And he said, if you do maintain your precepts, and you do maintain your mindfulness, and you do meditate correctly, you're already a deva. He says, you're already an angel. And, uh, and it is kind of like that. It's like, it's like your body feels light, your mind feels bright, you feel happy and uh, blissful, contented, forgiving, benevolent. So when things are good, that's how we feel. And when those uh, conditions degenerate, it's like you can feel less than human at times. And, um, yeah. So we've been on a bit of a meandering uh, uh, road. I hope that some of what I offered this evening was helpful to some of you. And I uh, wish us all good luck in cultivating the wholesome and um, abandoning the unwholesome and uh, training ourselves to have sharp, clear mindfulness. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to offer reflections. I always like to ask if, if anybody wanted to ask about anything that I spoke about. Any confusion, any comments, any... Is it clear enough? Yep. Uh, right. In this particular place, or? Um, to speak frankly, I think the reason it's not emphasized is because most people can't do it. And so, you want to try to make things practical. Part of what I was talking about, this Vitaka and Vichara, uh, this, what Westerners do, the way we've been educated to, th to think a lot, our minds are delighting in diversity, as the Buddha would say. There's a lot of um, mental activity, a lot of proliferation. So, even very, very well practiced monks, Salampo Panyawado, most senior Western disciple of Ajahn Mahabua, told a bunch of Western monks, so these are people who've made the commitment to train as monks and who've left and you know, living as monks in Thailand, and he's told them, unless you have a particular gift for samadhi, he didn't recommend trying to make attaining the jhanas the goal. So this was someone who actually had jhana and I believe was established on the path to enlightenment. He said, uh, for most Westerners, Westerners, and I think Ajahn Chah also stressed this, skillful reflection combined with whatever amount of peacefulness you can generate will ripen as jhanas at some point, but that's the path one has to follow. If, if you're in the situation that we're in, a lot of thinking, and uh, no particular gift for amazing refined states of samadhi. Cultivating as much peacefulness as you can. When the mind begins to wander, think wisely and skillfully, then hopefully some more peacefulness will come back. If you come to meditate, the mind isn't peaceful. Use skillful reflection to make the mind peaceful, to bring it to peacefulness. That kind of using reflection, using thought to make the mind peaceful. That will ripen as jhana eventually. But there was an emphasis upon Cultivating right view, what Ajahn Chah is teaching, reflecting on impermanence, uncertainty, recognizing unwholesome as unwholesome, relinquishing it, that will ripen as jhana. 
but making the jhana the goal, um, most people, a lot of, I've known a lot of monks who wanted jhana within a certain amount of years and most of them disrobe. So it's like if you set an agenda, you want something in a, with a particular time frame, it, it doesn't happen, you get very frustrated and disappointed. Whereas if you make your practice sustainable, cultivate your right view, cultivate as much peacefulness as you can, cultivate contentment, those kind of qualities will ripen in jhana and it's not really up to us when that happens. Um, my teacher in Ajahnan, again, he, he's more cosmological than a lot of Ajahns. He said when developing jhana, he says matter-of-factly is a process of lifetimes and directly associated with how generous a being has been. So if you haven't been practicing lifetimes of generosity, you don't have to believe me, I'm just telling you what he says. And, but I believe him. If you don't have a very powerful generosity practice behind you, it's unlikely that your mind will absorb into jhana. And if you don't have impeccable virtue for lifetimes, it's also unlikely that the mind will absor absorb into jhana. So that might be one of the reasons it's not stressed. Most modern people's virtue isn't rock solid. And most people haven't been that generous. What we do have as a strength is a reflective faculty. So we can train the mind to think wisely and that leads to momentary concentration and then neighborhood concentration and eventually jhana. But that seems to be what uh, the teachers in Thailand are stressing, even to contemporary Thais, because they're, these days they're educated like we are. There's more of an emphasis upon things like death reflection and uh, cultivating metta and uh, those kind of things. So hope that answered your question. Anything I think that's fine. It's like basically this is what we have to do. We have to make these lists work for ourselves, and the um, and then in terms of cultivating wholesome mind states, the vichara actually does have to absorb into a very blissful and tranquil state, which is, well, there won't be much thought there. If there is thought, it'll be very focused and sustained. But that um, vichara does, I think, also have that faculty. It's like investigating the qualities of things. So this is what we do often, I think, Westerners. And when we read the political commentary, and there is a lot of trying to suss out things. But for the, for the mind to be inclined towards blissful mind states, it's actually about staying with something very simple for a sustained period of time. And this is what's difficult for us. But if the virtue is good, and if the generosity is good, and if the sati, the meditation is consistent, it does get easier. And the meditation, the samadhi gets deeper and broader and, and more powerful. So. You're saying that when you investigate sleepiness, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, you b exactly. You notice the feelings of sleepiness, and the mind wakes up. That's right. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs>